Okay, so uh, this first talk for today covers MapReduce and just a little bit of Hadoop is actually an implementation of MapReduce. So, I told you there is this thing called MapReduce, which is a cool technology invented very long ago for doing uh, computation in parallel. Uh, by the way, as I mentioned over here, uh, some of the slides in here are taken from talks which are available on the web. I have just acknowledged a few of those here. So, what is MapReduce? It is basically a platform for reliable, scalable parallel computing. When MapReduce was first introduced, reliability was not one of the requirements. It was just a simple way of expressing how to do something in parallel. There have been many, many attempts at uh, specifying how to do things in parallel for many years. Parallel uh, computers were, have been in use for you know, at least 40 years till now. So, there were many different paradigms for uh, expressing how to parallelize a certain task. One paradigm, for example, was to have a Unix process which forked and then each process did some work and eventually uh, they finished up, they joined again, meaning when they are done, they tell the parent process that I am done and as an extension, the processes could be uh, started on a remote machine. So, one machine starts off all these processes on remote machines they do some work using local data, meaning the central process has to push data to the local machines, they work locally and then they gather the data and output it. In fact, this is what actually happens today also, but one of the important things is a lot of the details of partitioning the data, repartitioning the data, uh, starting up these processes, all that is hidden by this map reduce infrastructure, which lets you just specify what you want computed and everything else is done by this pre-built infrastructure. The infrastructure not only simplifies the programming, it also allows effective uh, handling of failures. When you have thousands of machines in running in parallel, something will fail. The infrastructure will mask this failure and let somebody else do the computation which the failed machines were doing and the computation succeeds even though underneath the hardware has failed, the machine has failed, but the computation as a whole succeeds. So, that is the idea. So, it abstracts away issues of distributed and parallel environment, including failure and so on. Now, the current implementations of MapReduce actually work on uh, what is called a distributed file system. What are distributed file systems? If you use a machine today, it has a disk and whatever uh, data is on the local disk is part of your file system. There are some extensions which let you uh, share the file system meaning you can mount a file system from a file server and access it locally. But this is not very scalable. There is a single file server and every request has to go, uh, for a file goes to that file server and comes back. That file server will get beaten up if you have thousands of machines asking for files from it. It is not scalable. Instead, what these distributed file systems do is they actually have thousands of machines and the file itself, each file itself is distributed across multiple machines. So, the overall the files are distributed across thousands of machines. So, if I want to access a file, it could be on any one of these thousand machines and this distributed file system is in charge of figuring out where the file is and it will fetch the file for me if I read from it. So, that is a basic idea. Again, uh, the idea of distributed file systems is very old. Uh, there were projects uh, way back in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, actually I guess not 70s, early 80s, there were distributed file systems projects uh, which showed how to build such file systems. The, that era was actually really cool because a lot of the technology which we are using today, both in terms of uh, you know what is MapReduce, uh, how do you build distributed file systems, how do they operate in spite of failures. A lot of the technology was invented in the late 70s, early mid 80s. So, today what we are doing is actually using many concepts from back there, but at a scale which was never done back there. So, there are some new issues also. So, today there are several file systems which are very widely used. Google file system is a distributed file system which is used within Google, it is not available outside. Hadoop file system is a similar distributed file system which is actually available in public domain. So, you open source, you can go get it. There are a few more. There is a file system called the Cosmics file system, KFS, which is also like 
Google file system. So, let me tell you a little bit about these file systems before I get into the MapReduce paradigm itself, so that you can understand better how these things work. So, first of all, these are highly scalable distributed systems with, uh, you know, the number of nodes in there. Um, Google and Yahoo routinely run computations with 10,000 processors. There is a data center with many racks, each rack holding, let us say, 40 to 100 machines. And then there are tens to maybe hundreds of these racks in the center. So, 10,000 machines running in parallel the files are distributed across all of them. And the, how many files can you store in this level? A hundred million files is nothing out of the ordinary for this scale. How much data? 10 petabytes is nothing out of the ordinary. How much is 10 petabytes? Uh, petabyte is a thousand terabytes. So, this is one thousand terabyte, uh, sorry, ten thousand disks each of a terabyte. So, each of these 10,000 nodes has multiple disks aggregating to a few terabytes each and then you have 10,000 times that much. So, the scale of data is absolutely enormous. And the next thing to note is that in an earlier era, anything which was had to be up a lot meant that you bought a very reliable mainframe system from IBM that was the original era. In the next era, you bought a very reliable uh, computer from Sun. Now, uh, or for that matter, IBM. Uh, not a mainframes were still around, but regular Unix servers from Sun and IBM, they are very, very well engineered products. We have had some of those run non stop for, uh, you know, 10, maybe, I do not know about 10, but I, I know personally I have seen several of them which never gave a single problem in about 7 or 8 years of service. Eventually, they died not because their hardware was bad, but because of the dust level we had here. Uh, ruining their uh, fans and their cooling systems and so on. So, if they were in a, a less uh, hostile environment uh, than a room in IIT Bombay, they would have probably lasted another 10 years. They are very, very good machines, but they are very expensive. And if you need 10,000 such machines, you are going to go broke. So, what Google did, their uh, engineering is really fabulous. So, their engineering teams figured let us not do this. Let us buy the cheapest machines there are out there and put 10,000 of them. Well, they are cheap machines. They are cheap for a reason. They are not as well engineered as these re highly reliable systems. They are going to fail. You know that. If you buy a you know, cheap uh, Chinese thing in the market today, you know it is going to fail. You expect it to fail very, very soon. In fact, uh, uh, there is a good chance that it will fail even before you use it. So, uh, somebody I know uh, said that in an earlier area it was, uh, you know, you buy it, you use it once and throw it. Now, in, in the current era of really cheap uh, Chinese goods, you buy it and then you, it does not work and you throw it and then you buy another one. So, it is buy and throw, it is not use and throw. So, well, Google did not use such really, really bad computers. They bought reasonable ones, but they are going to fail. And Google's brilliant idea, their engineer's brilliant idea was, let them fail. We will build a software layer on top, which deals with all these failures and handle it. And now, this Google file system is an example. It is spread over tens of thousands of machines. Yes, some of them are guaranteed to be down at any point of time. How can the file system work if a machine is down? What about the data on that machine? And the simple answer is, Google file system keeps every piece of data on at least three machines. So, if even if two of them are dead, the third one is going to be alive and can process your request. So, replication is really core to this. Just as we saw with parallel databases, with a distributed file system too, files are replicated. Now, a distributed file system is a platform on which we can run these parallel operations, because you can have all these thousands of nodes. By the way, the data is stored on 10,000 computers. Each of those 10,000 computers is not just storing data, it is also running code. It is not sitting idle, just storing data. So, when a piece of code runs on it, it can access data which is local, but that is not a constraint. It can very well go access data from anywhere of in the file system, which means any of these other 10,000 machines 
may have the data it needs, it can fetch it. So, uh, basically there is a single namespace, meaning think of a Unix file system. Uh, there is a namespace, you say slash home slash uh, you know your username slash some directory and so forth. So, they have a single uh, namespace for all the files in this entire 10,000 node cluster. So, it is easy to refer to files. And they all look like they are locally available, but they are actually brought in on demand as required. There are some issues of coherency. What if two people write at the same time to a single file? This can cause problems. And they have a very nice solution. Um, basically, uh, what they do is, uh, usually there is a master for a file or a piece of a file. So, every request to write to that file is sent to that master. So, it becomes the serialization point for writes to it. Moreover, if you have many people writing to the same file at the same location of the file, they will clobber each other all the time. So, the basic way in which these files are written is by appending data, which makes a lot of sense. In fact, if you look at most of these applications, files are of one of two forms. A file is like something which is created once and never modified. Like a document or a web page which is crawled, it is read from the web, stored in a file, never ever updated. So, that is a write once. There is another kind like log files and so on, where you keep appending data. So, in fact, these are the only two kinds of files pretty much in these systems, write once or keep appending. So, those are the two operations which are supported. Okay. Now, a file itself may be extremely large. So, what a file system like Google does is it breaks up the file into pieces. The pieces are big, they are not small. Each piece is something like 128 megabytes. So, for really large files, you need such big pieces. So, now, uh, this chunk of 128 megabytes would be the unit. It is replicated in several machines. Now, when a client wants to read a file, it will talk to some servers to find out where all the pieces of that file reside, the different blocks of that file, and then it will go fetch it directly from those machines. So, it is very parallel, except for one part, which is to find out where does this file reside. For that, you have to go somewhere. Even that is parallelized in some clever ways. So, overall, everything runs uh, in parallel without going through any central location. Now, the Hadoop file system, HDFS, is like a Google file system. Uh, and for this, I managed to get a figure uh, from the web, which shows how it works. So, you have all these data nodes. So, these are all individual machines. And if somebody needs to read data, the first step they do is um, go to a master called a name node and say, here is a file name. Uh, tell me where it is located. So, what this fellow says is, here are the block IDs and the machines where the blocks are located. So, then the client gets, th this amount of data is small. Even for a very large file, there is a small amount of data. At which point, it goes and fetches all the blocks from corresponding nodes. Very parallel access. So, the name node, that is the master, basically keeps metadata. What are the file names? Where are the files located? And where are the replicas of a file located? And so, the client gets this metadata and then does the read from the data nodes. What this shows is that the data is uh, sitting in a, there are many machines in a rack and there are multiple racks. Now, racks are often subject to coordinated failure sometimes, maybe the switch dies. So, the replica which is on a rack is actually, if, if you have a node uh, here which has a certain block of data, is replicated on a different rack. Now, this works for certain kinds of computations. For your email, what if the entire data center storing your email goes down? And you log into Google Mail, Yahoo Mail, you can't access it. You are not going to be happy. In fact, what they do is uh, they have a complete replica of the data center itself somewhere else. So, even if this data center dies, you can still read your email. So, they give very high availability as a result. So, it, in, in fact, this is very interesting. High availability was once the preserve of a few critical applications like banking applications. The rest of the people did not have high availability. Today, we take it for granted. You know, if Gmail is down for one hour, it is in the newspapers. This is incredible. Here is a service which runs 24 by 7 
24 hours a day, 7 days a week, you know, every week of the year. And in a whole year, it probably fails for a few hours. And even that is reported in the papers. That itself is uh, viewed as surprising. The same with Yahoo Mail or any of the other mails. They have tremendously high availability. And what is interesting is all of these run on tremendously unreliable hardware underneath. And all of them have a software layer above which masks all these hardware failures and gives this very, very high availability. Okay, so that was a detour into the distributed file system. So now let's look at MapReduce. So initially, whatever data which you wanted, huge amount of data, all the web crawl or whatever else it was, is stored in multiple files across this distributed file system. Now let's take a very, very simple task to illustrate what MapReduce does. So this particular task is, you're given a number of documents. I want to find how many times each word occurs across the entire collection. This is a toy. Uh, it's not very useful normally. But because it's a toy, we can show what it, how to do it very easily. So first of all, how do you do it in parallel? So it's a count problem. Now, if you remember, we saw how to do it in SQL, count on a relation. Uh, what did we do? We had the rows partition. We computed the counts per shop ID locally and then gathered it and added it up. The same idea works here. Um, so you divide the documents amongst the workers. The documents are physically on the file system, um, but they are processed in parallel by all the workers. Each worker reads whatever documents are assigned to it, finds all the words and outputs word count pairs. That is, in that document, how many times does the word occur? In fact, if you see in the MapReduce computation, uh, they can even do something really dumb. Although, they would, uh, in reality, this is what they would do. The example is simplified even more to make it even easier to see how it is parallelized. So, the idea is, instead of outputting a word count pair, each time they see the word, they can output a word and one, the count of one. It's a bit silly. It's obvious optimization is each for each document, you see how many times the word occurs. But without that optimization, still, see a word, output word 1. Very easy to write. Now, what we have is the output of the first phase is a set of word and count pairs, which are per document, or just word and 1, word 1, or how many ever times it occurs in that document. Now, we have to group by word and add up these counts, obvious SQL operation. And we saw how to do that. We partition the data and uh, we can do it in parallel across many machines. That is what the second part of uh, MapReduce does. It, in this particular example, the word count pairs are partitioned by word. In this case, the key, the group by a partitioning key is the word. And they are partitioned by word, meaning all pairs for a particular word will land upon one machine. And you do this partitioning across 10,000 machines. Now, each machine has got a collection of data and it does a local group by and then sum up the count. So, this is actually an operation which you could pretty much write in SQL except for one step. The fact that you have a document, how do you take the document, parse it and get the word count? That is not something which you can do in SQL easily. Although, if you add an ability to call user defined functions from SQL, well, you could do it actually with an extended SQL. In fact, um, some system like the Aster data systems, which I mentioned earlier, they have a MapReduce, which is built inside of SQL by using user-defined functions. So, it is actually not very different. MapReduce and SQL, uh, parallel query processing in SQL are very closely related. We will come back to this later. Okay, so, that was the intuition for how to, to do the word count. MapReduce is a paradigm, meaning the infrastructure lets you do two operations. One is map, one is reduce. But these are not actual operations. They are kind of meta operations. Meaning, you the programmer have to specify what the map function does. You have to give an implementation of the map function. You have to give an implementation of the reduce function. The map function is essentially something which is like pre-processing and outputting uh, the groups along with some associated value, group value. The output of map is a group and a value. The reduce operation basically takes all the elements in a particular group and aggregates them. 
reduces basically aggregation. So, that is basically map reduce, but the difference from SQL is that you the programmer write the map and the reduce function and you can write this in C code or Java code. If you do it in Hadoop, it is Java. Uh, I think Google's map reduce may be C based, I am not sure. Okay. So, this came from uh, functional programming languages like Lisp originally long ago. So, the input to this is a set of key value pairs and there are two functions. There is a map function which takes a key value pair and outputs a list of some other key value pairs. So, in our uh, word counting, the initial key value is a document ID and the document. The document ID is the key the value is the actual document content. So, the map function takes the document ID and the document content and outputs some of a list of k 1 v 1. What is k 1? k 1 is the word, v 1 is the count of the word in the document. So, for one input document, it outputs a number of k 1 v 1 pairs, it is a list of those pairs. The reduce function is basically the aggregation function. What it does is, for a particular word, it is given a list of all the values. So, think of this as you have done the grouping and for a group, you have all the values, the multi set of the values. In this case, it is called a list. You have a list of values. So, the map function is basically the aggregation function and what it outputs is a value. For that particular key, it gives a value. So, in our word counting, the group by is done on word and the reduce function adds up the counts which it has got for that word and gives one final count. And of course, this is done in parallel uh, for different words on different machines. So, map and reduce can both be parallelized. In between the map and the reduce, the infrastructure has to do something very important. This list over here, on each machine it has many different words. Over here, all the counts for a given word have to be on one machine. So, in between these two steps, the infrastructure has to uh, repartition the data which is in these lists and that is a important part of the map reduce infrastructure. So, the infrastructure takes care of everything underneath. You the programmer have to define these two functions plus a little bit more on uh, you know how the initial data is stored and how it who should work on what part of the data. There is a little bit more you have to specify. Once you have done that, the infrastructure runs. What if there is a failure? If you look at it, these are actually, if, if a particular machine was handling a set of documents, it failed in the map phase. What do you do? Well, you already know what all map tasks that machine was supposed to do. Some other machine does that particular work. Once this fails, it is okay. You, whatever partial work it did, you throw it out and start afresh on another machine. So, you can deal with failures on map. Similarly, for reduce. We will come to this later. So, the paradigm works out very nicely with respect to handling failures. So, let me show the map and the reduce task again, uh, this time pictorially. So, what do we have here? The initial um, you know values k 1, k 2, k n and the uh, keys and the values. So, these were document id and the document content. The map produced a list of word and count pairs from each of these documents. So, there is a whole collection of these, which are distributed across all the machines, word, word count pairs. Now, what the reduce step does, the infrastructure takes this collection of uh, intermediate key value pairs, which is in our example, word and word count, local word count per document. And now, it does the grouping. So, for a particular word, the purple word, it gets all the counts together and creates a list. Similarly, for the uh, whatever yellowish word here, it gets a set of values and so forth. So, for each word, it collects together all the partial counts and then calls a reduce function. So, this grouping is done by the system, you do not control it. Well, you control it in the sense, you have specified what is the key and the grouping is by that key. The reduce function now collects all the values together and does the aggregation and finally, outputs this. So, that reduce function is provided by you the programmer. Okay. So, that is in a nutshell that is what map reduces, but the reduce function can do very complex work beyond what the SQL aggregation functions do. Uh, so, again like I said, 
SQL uh, people have not sat quiet. In fact, for a long time, SQL uh, databases have provided uh, user defined aggregate functions, which let you uh, do uh, basically aggregation in your own C code. PostgreSQL supports this, for example. So, it is actually fairly easy to take a reduce function and stick it into the database and thereby you can do map reduce in a database today, uh, at least on Aster. Others will catch up for sure, they are not yet there. So, I have been saying map and reduce uh, in an abstract sense. For the word count problem, here is exactly the specification of the map function. So, the map function takes an input key and an input value, both are strings. So, many of the map reduce guys, they just treat data as strings for simplicity. And uh, of course, data as strings is not a good idea for many applications. So, these will evolve to allow more complex data types. But assuming they are just strings, uh, what it does is for each word w in input value, you just go through the document. Input value here is a document and you go through the contents of the document and every time you find a word, you break it up into words as you go along. You output emit intermediate w comma 1. 1 is a count. So, actually this step is not even bothering to uh, count how many times the word occurs in a document. The moment it finds a word, it outputs w 1. It is creating more network load. So, this is not actually a good idea from a performance perspective, but it is correct. So, now there are all these collections of word and just 1, the value 1. So, now what it does is the reduce function uh, is getting a word with all the associated counts. So, what it says is for each v in intermediate values, uh, it gets a key and an intermediate values. What is this intermediate values? This is a list of counts in our particular example. It is an iterator, which means you can step through those counts, but again the data type is a string. So, what it has to do is it takes the count, which is stored as a string it parses int meaning takes the string, converts it to an int and adds that value to the result. So, now what it has done is this for loop has gone over all the counts for a particular word and then it emit as string result. What does that mean? The result is an integer, it converts it to a string and emits it. So, now the system has a collection of word and final count for the word again represented as strings where does this output go? Where does the output come in from? These are two important questions. And all of these map reduce systems, they take their input from the distributed file system and stick their results, the final results back in the distributed file system. So, that is how they work. They also have all these intermediate results uh, that they typically do not stick in the file system. They keep locally, repartition and then make it available uh, for the reduce function. So, here is roughly how this whole thing is architected. You have a user program, um, well, the, the some master program and this is actually your map and reduce functions linked with the map reduce library of Hadoop or whatever. And what it does is it starts up these worker processes on all the machines which are running and each of these is reading part of the input data, which it gets from a distributed file system. So, somewhere in here, um, there is a master process, which has told this worker, which part of the data it is responsible for. So, it will collect whatever part of the input data it is responsible for and it runs the map function here. This worker runs the map function and its result is uh, kept at local files temporarily. Then, that result is repartition. Remember, um, whenever we uh, did a, 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 a join, we had to repartition um, or when we wanted to do a distributed aggregation, we had to repartition. This is a distributed aggregation. So, repartitioning is required based on the key, which in our example is the word. So, the repartitioning is on word here and you have another set of workers. This set of workers could be a smaller number. If you expect uh, this data to be small, you could have fewer workers here. That is why it is shown as 3 and 2. Each of these collects its data and the reduce function 
defined by the programmer is called on each of those pieces of uh, data which it has got, computes the aggregate result and outputs it to a file. These files are also in the distributed file system. What this means is that now any uh, guy, the master can collect all these files which are in, in the distributed file system, it reads it just like their local files and outputs them, it is done. So, an important thing is that MapReduce allows imperative code written in C or Java to do the functions of map and reduce. That gives you power which SQL does not give you. SQL is fantastic for certain tasks. For certain other tasks, it is it's a limited language, let us accept it. So, that is one kind of thing which let them do uh, computing page rank from a collection of web crawl documents. Build keyword indices on these documents. It turns out even this is very effectively parallelized. So, in parallel you build the indices and then do some merging. Um, if you want to do any analysis on all those web click logs, it is inherently parallel. You have the log files distributed on the distributed file system. Start a map reduce job, you can specify all that you need to do, analyzing the raw log files in, in map reduce. And today, uh, apparently, um, in engineers in Google and Yahoo run, first of all, a lot of their production jobs which need to be highly parallel. Everything is on map reduce these days. This is what we have heard from recent talks from people from Google and Yahoo. Moreover, it is not just regular jobs. But even, you know, if an engineer wants to do some analysis to see, should I tweak the ranking function somehow, they can do all this analysis in parallel on huge volumes of queries using MapReduce. So, it is used day in and day out in these places. It has been a tremendous success. And there was a paper from Google on MapReduce, uh, which started off this whole thing. And later, uh, others realized that this is a fantastic way of doing things and many people have implemented it. Hadoop is one such implementation, which uh, was built uh, at Yahoo and open sourced. So, as I was saying, there was a big debate, in fact, a war between database researchers and the MapReduce people. The database researchers saying, you guys are idiots, you are reinventing stuff and you are not even doing it that well. And then those people said, nya nya, you can't do this, you can't do that. So, there was a little bit of truth to both camps. The first camp probably ignored all the parallel database work, which they should have said, yes, parallel databases do the same thing. Here exactly is what we are doing new. They did not say that. They claimed a little too much. But once you analyzed it more soberly, you found that, yes, some stuff they had done was known. But actual implementations that runs on thousands of machines, handling failure seamlessly, and allowing procedural code, which gives tremendous power, is all new. So, that is. Um, so, who all use MapReduce? Google has an implementation. It is not available publicly, but it is used all the time in Google. Hadoop is an open source implementation in Java, which uses Hadoop FS, we saw it earlier, as the storage. You can actually download Hadoop and set it up and run it in your institute. You can run it on just a few machines if you want. You do not need 10,000 machines. None of us has 10,000 machines to run it on. Uh, but actually, we do have a lot of machines. We have labs with hundreds of machines. So, if you think about it, most of those machines are sitting idle most of the time. Uh, so, you can actually run distributed file systems and Hadoop across all those machines, especially when nobody is using them. Microsoft has Dryad, Aster has MapReduce embedded inside an SQL database. So, they claim you can get the best of both worlds. You can do procedural stuff if you want. You can also get the full power of SQL if you want. And then there's pointers to what you should be looking up. Uh, you can take this later. The original MapReduce paper, the GFS paper, and for the other ones, Hadoop, HDFS, and so on, there are no papers, but there's a lot of material on the web. Instead of giving you pointers, I'm just suggesting you do a Google or any other search engine search and then dig deeper into those. Okay? For a change, uh, I'm done exactly on time for the break. I'll try to keep it up after this also. Thank you and we will take questions after the break.